everybody, and welcome to this brand new episode of the Satisfied God Podcast. Raven Bird here with you. Thanks for uh, downloading this new uh, uploaded episode. Tonight I'm doing the um, intro to this. This is a pre-recorded uh, session that I did a couple of weeks ago uh, on Zoom on Psalms uh, 119. When we finished the Psalms 119 episode previous to this, uh, I began to look at a particular portion of the verses that we dealt with that spoke of God's faithfulness that extended throughout all generations. And that phrase just stood out to me, and I began to look at it a little deeper, a little more. I thought perhaps that it would be a small introduction to a lesson, but it became the whole lesson. And the Lord just began to open it up to show me the generation or the generations of which this verse is speaking and how God's faithfulness extended throughout these generations. And it has to do, again, context. To contextualize these things in view of the testimony itself and how God related to his people, how God made promises, how the prophet spoke, how God utilized things, uh, people, kings, all of the elements of the testimony. And he did so to declare his faithfulness, to declare his intention, to fulfill what he had promised to fulfill the promise of salvation, of righteousness, of the messianic kingdom. And his faithfulness was to those generations that were eagerly anticipating God's promises to be fulfilled in total completely they waited under an administration of law and prophets under the schoolmaster until the time appointed of God and then God sent his son as the culmination of his promise as the amen of his prophetic words and of all of the testimony that he had used throughout all of those generations, utilizing time and, as, as Hebrews would say, in diverse manners, manifold ways, to testify of one man. And he sent that one man as the manifestation of his faithfulness to his people that he had not lied to them. He had not withheld the good thing that he had promised, but he sent a man as the embodiment of his faithfulness fulfilled. So this is what we deal with during this session. <clears throat> and I think it's very important to look at this because so many of us think about God's faithfulness throughout all generations, and as we always do, we in error self-interpret the scriptures, meaning we interpret it with our immediate situation, our immediate um, day and time in view. And in so doing, we miss the weight of these things. To know that God's faithfulness extended throughout all generations is to understand that God has never changed his mind, that his intent, which was 
predetermined, preordained, has come to be fulfilled. We're not waiting. We're not looking for something more. We have dwelling in us right now as born-again believers. God's ultimate intent, God's faithfulness, manifestly revealed in the beloved Son of God. And to me, that is so significant. What else can there possibly be that we are awaiting? What else can there possibly be that God can do to make our salvation more complete than bestowing and imputing to our souls the consummation of his eternal purpose, every prophecy, every promise, yes and amen. That's the salvation we have. The salvation that we now have as believers, those who by faith have received Christ, the salvation we now have is God's faithfulness that he had declared to his people through type shadows, testimonies, laws, commandments. Now by his spirit, by finished work and by spiritual birth, abides and makes his residence in our soul. That's a great salvation. And we talk about that during this session. Again, such a wonderful reality. I want you to just listen to these things and, and consider how rich the salvation that he has imputed to us by his grace truly is. So let's get right into the lesson. Again, thank you guys for being there. Love you very much. Amen. What I'm going to talk about tonight, I thought would just be maybe like a, you know, one or two page little part of something else. And it kind of grew into its own thing because there's really something significant to this. And it has to do with the verses we read last time, but a specific portion that we really didn't touch on. <clears throat> And that's uh, in verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And we dealt with that the last class uh, completely. But this is the part that really struck me in this uh, last few couple weeks. Thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Um, now, of course, it ends, thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. And we talked about that a little bit. But this, this idea of the faithfulness of God, um, the faithfulness of God to all generations, or faithfulness unto all generations is something that I have never really looked at. And, and I'm not going to take the time to rehash the things that we've said in the previous couple of uh, times together with, with regard to the faithfulness the commandments of God being faithful or faithfulness and the, the fact that the word of God is established forever in heaven. And we talked about last time, but those two things are vital to understand this, this thought or this phrase concerning the faithfulness of God that continues unto all generations. Um, they have to be seen in direct connection significance of this uh, phrase really demonstrates why it's extremely important for us to understand the distinction, but yet the singular theme of both the old and the new covenants. And um, and I guess you could say the old and the new testaments. Because if not, it's difficult to appreciate the real significance of uh, the faithfulness of God extending unto all generations. Because immediately we'll take it to ourselves and we'll begin to interpret it with ourselves, our family, our posterity, our, you know, all of that in view. And that's, that's not what it's talking about at all. And what it is talking about is so significant here, especially when... Again, we look at the grand thought and theme behind this 
this psalm. To get into this, let me first just take the time to, to concentrate on that uh, with regard to the distinction between the old and the new covenants and not only the distinction, but the, the sameness of theme and thought and intention. And it goes hand in hand with what we said about the word of God being established forever in heaven. Uh, that what we come into is something pre predetermined and settled upon before we even come to it or even exist to come to it. The fact is God has never changed his mind with regard to his purpose, or his plan, with regard to the soul of men. And although we see throughout the scripture multiple covenants made, and we may even look at the old and the new covenant and look at them as two totally distinct things, we miss a lot when we look at it in that way. And so when we see multiple covenants made, just remember that when you see this, there's in multiple accounts, it's always taken back to this. This covenant is according to the one that you made with. Abraham or Isaac or Jacob. It's always worded that way because the, the thought is to always keep relation and connection to that one main covenant that God had made and every other covenant cut had that as a reference point. Because what it's showing is there is a continuity here and not a diversion. God never diverts his attention from that one covenant. He never deviates from it. And when we think that way, then we met, miss a lot of things and, and we can really uh, have, a, have a real uh, problem on our hands because then we get this angry God of the old covenant and this happy God of the new covenant. You know, a God that has repented from his evil, wicked ways of killing all those people. And now he loves everybody. These are these are false understandings and false interpretations with regard to God's covenant, because we think in those terms of, of different covenants that God has, because we call it old and new. But the vital thing to understand here, and Paul would say that the law, which was uh, 430 years after the one that he covenanted that he was made that was made with Abraham could never annul the covenant that was made with Abraham. And the covenant that was made with Abraham was a covenant of imputed righteousness through faith that was that had everything to do with the seed that was coming. And that again. He could say that because there was no diversion by God. The, God didn't change his mind or anything because what we're seeing is something that Paul would say in the context of all that. He would say that this thing was confirmed and ratified of God before in Christ Jesus. So there was not a departure from the original thought in the original plan. It was actually instigated the law itself that we think was a diversion or, or God departing from the original plan because of man's sin. It was actually instigated by God to keep the purpose and the will intact. It was there to keep everything intact until the rightful heir came until the intended man came, the seed to whom the promises were made arrived. That's, that was the purpose of the law. It wasn't a, a secondary thing that was distinct in thought. It was to keep that thought until the one who was intended by the original thing came to receive what belonged to him. So we don't have two mutually exclusive covenants or relationships that God has with his people. And if we if we see that God had made a covenant based on faith first, which is what he did, I think we can ultimately see the testimony of a, as we've been talking about, a pre-confirmed uh, pre covenant with a seed 
before the giving of the law, so that the end of the testimony, its overall purpose was that the one who was preordained by it as a testimony would finally come. And again, John the Baptist um, says this, John chapter 1, verse 15, John Barry, well, this John re, uh, writes of John the Baptist, says, John bear witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake, and he that cometh after me is preferred before me, because he was before me. And we talked about this the last time in the word that was settled in heaven, but the word before here is is a word that denotes rank it, it, it's it also means uh you know preeminent he was before me he was the preeminent thought here not me he was the great and prominent foremost intent and it also means and this is important when we get into this and understand the testimony and the fulfillment of the testimony it's the first in a series of things in many ways and many times god spake but there was an originating thought there was an originating substance that was the basis of it to even exist and that was him and the whole thing stood until he came it stood there until he see this is who john embodied in his ministry john the baptist he entire he embodied the entire age of the testimony of the law and the prophets john writes that the law and the prophets testified until john not until christ but until john because john was the one who finally summarizing their their testimony just finally brought it to its conclusion and pointed to a man and says, here he is, the Lamb of God. Behold, he has come. And so in that, you see how there is a distinction between the testimony and the fulfillment, or you could say the old and the new, but there is a singular purpose. This man had a singular purpose. And that was who he was, what he represented, had a predetermination to it. It was not his ministry. Therefore, he could he could back away when the when the groom when the groom finally came on the scene. He could back away and said, "His increase is my decrease." And I said that this morning. We try to take that, you know, we take that verse out of John and we apply it to ourselves, and we say he must increase. I must decrease. And then boy, we're on that roller coaster ride of trying our best yeah. to get him to increase and get us to decrease. Mm -hmm. When John says this, he doesn't say it as a prescription for every other human being. He says it describing the extent of his purpose. And that was, now that the groom has come, you can read his whole narrative. Now that the groom has arrived to take the hand of his bride, the joy of my heart as the friend of the groom is that I am in such close vicinity to him now, I can hear his voice. And now that I can hear his voice, I can gladly stand back and say, it's all yours. Amen. My purpose is done. I'm, I have no reason to continue. This is not about men trying to be better and to decrease in whatever thing we need to decrease in. It's about a testimony giving way to the purpose for which it stood. And in this, we see God's faithfulness throughout all generations. To all generations, what does that mean? Because we do, we totally miss that. But it has everything to do with the fact that his word has been settled before there was anything made. And it was out of that word that anything that was made was made. So 
you know, you have verses in the scripture that says, you know, the law kept them until the seed should come. That the law was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. That the law is spiritual. We are carnal. And these and many other places plainly tell us that God never had two differing covenants or relations with his people, but one and only one. And the only distinction between what we call two different covenants is that the first was external. And it was promissory, meaning that it was indicative of something to come and it was full of promise. But the second is internal and eternal. And it's not promissory, it is performed in one person who abides in us. And I'm reading these things because we have to see the intention that runs through the whole of God's word and how God ties it all together in just one beloved son. And so what we're going to read in a moment is what is actually meant when the Psalm says faithful unto all generations. This has a scriptural basis behind it. This doesn't have a present day situational application to it because we read it that way. And, and let me explain what I mean by that because many and, and do, and I hear it a lot of times because you know me, I'm an idiot and I listen to Christian television sometimes. Uh, you know, just to, just to see, <laughs> just to see what's out there. And uh, my wife goes to bed really quick when I do, but <laughs> I will uh, too. yeah, many, but you know, I'm taking the punches, you know, for everybody. Uh, so many, <laughs> you know, many read these things and, and if they don't recognize the preordination of the testimony and the word of God and how it had one and one only as its perspective, they'll take those words that he is faithful to all generations, that his faithfulness extends to all generations, and they'll interpret it as pertaining to their own personal lineage. I've seen this happen. So they'll say, well, God's faithful to all my children and their children's children. And they'll say, why? Because I serve God and I've served him all my life. So, you know, God's made a promise that he's going to be faithful to all our generations and to my children's children. I love that, you know, people say that children, our children, 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 children. <laughs> you know, a real significant study, if you want to really get into it, is go to that phrase, children's children, and, and look that up. You'll find that he's talking about exactly what we're going to talk about tonight. Your children's children, not talking about your son, daughter, grandkid, and great grandkid. Now, in Christ, we're all blessed. So the greatest thing to do is to tell your children, your children's children, and their children, come to Christ, be born again. There's the true blessing unto all generations. But that's not what this is talking about. You know, we want them to all be rich, wealthy, and healthy, and all that stuff. Well, everybody wants that. That's great. I hope they are. But I'm saying that's not what this scripture has in mind. And the reason we read it that way is because we self-interpret it. So we think it has situational applications. And, uh, you know, when things in the family or in our, you know, the lineage of our family are not very positive, we'll still lean back on the word and we'll say his word to us is that he's faithful to all generations. And because we have a promise, God will take care of us and our children. And again, I'm not saying he doesn't take care of us. I'm just saying that's not what this verse means. <laughs> you know, and we especially do this when we understand the prophecies or when we, you know, we believe that the prophecies and the promises of God have some kind of personal interpretation or application. So what is it? What does he actually mean when he says that his faithfulness is unto all generations? I'll promise you this. 
it will always have Jesus Christ as both its author and its consummating thought. It will always end up being about Jesus. Amen. If it's not, then it's wrong. If it's about your nephew or your daughter, it's not according to the spirit. Again, I hope your nephew and daughter do great. Just saying the scripture is not about them. So it's not about this is the, the generations we think about. So it should also make us understand and see that it points to the generations. And I'll summarize it first and then we'll get into it. That what this is talking about and what this is pointing to is the generations that existed under an age of testimony and awaited the promises of God to finally be fulfilled and summarized. That's the generation that God was faithful to. He didn't lie to them. He made a promise and he fulfilled it to those generations. He was faithful. His word that was established before in the heavens upon one perfect life and one perfect man came to be fulfilled and his and in so doing he fulfilled his promise to all generations that were under that age of testimony and it he didn't fail he never failed in it most you know, most ideologies when it comes to, you know, eschatology and scriptural interpretation, we still believe that God lied because we still believe there's so much for God yet to do that he still hasn't done what he said he was going to do. Those people under that age, to that those people waiting on his promises to be fulfilled. And the fact is, if he has not fulfilled those things spoken to them, we don't have salvation. Because our salvation depends upon the fact that he has fulfilled his promises to those he made promise to. Because in Christ who is in us, all the promises of God are yes and amen. We don't have a salvation unless all things that he promised to these people has come to be fulfilled. So what does it mean? Faithful to all generations. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 1. Verse 1. We'll start looking at the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. The son of David. The son of Abraham. This is so significant. Now I'm going to read all this, not to bore you to death with these things that one beget another and one beget another, but we need to understand that there was a lot of time, a lot of age generations involved in this whole picture we call a testimony. God utilized real people and he utilizes real stretches of time, real generations to testify of one man. And that one man is the summation of God's faithfulness promised to his people. He is the faithfulness of God demonstrated. And you see it right here. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob begat uh, Judas and his brethren. Judas begot Ferris. Uh, my, I don't have my glasses on. Let me, <laughs> let me read this on the computer. Zerah of Thamar and Ferris begot Ezram. Ezram begot Aram. Aram begot Arnadab. Arminadab begot Nason. Nason begot Salmon. Salmon begot Bo Booz and Rachib. Of Rachib and Booz begot. Obed of Ruth, Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king, and the king and David the king begat Solomon. Of her, 
that had been the wife of Urias. Solomon begat Reboam, and Reboam begat Abia, and Abia begat Asa. Asa begat Josaphat, Josaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Josias. Josias begat Joatham, Joatham begat Achaz, and Achaz begat Ezekias. Ezekias begat Manassas, and Manassas begat Amon begat Josias, and Josias begat Jeconius and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconius begat somebody, and somebody begat <laughs> <laughs> and uh, speaking in now tongues and all these people. Now, here's the thing. And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary. God, the names got real simple in the new. Of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now, we'll get to that in a moment about Mary, because she says something in her in her speaking after the angel appears to her with regard to this. But in this, you see the generations that were affected, the generations of a testimony, God's promises, all the things that God did, the significance of time and people being used by God just to bring one man upon the scene just to bring forth one beautiful reality, the Christ, the Messiah, the one awaited, the one promised. And again, when you read a lot of the things, uh, you know, that the, that the Jews wrote in, you find that everything for the Jews hinged upon one thing, and that's the coming of their Messiah. Everything, the blessings, the riches, a kingdom, all of it rested upon. They were, it, it, they didn't do it like we do it. They didn't separate anything from that man. When he comes, everything good comes. Every blessing God promised comes. There's nothing separate from him. It all hinges upon his coming. And here you see this man's coming is the way it's beautifully worded and, and shown here is the consummation of all of this time, all of these generations, all of these people's hopes, because you're not just seeing people here go back and read their stories. I mean, going back and read the things that God promised them and all the ways that God used them to testify of this. And you see that God's faithfulness throughout those generations was that he was faithful to testify through those generations of one man and his faithfulness unto those generations was that that one came. God did not lie. God did not fail. He brought, and you'll notice that the generation of Jesus Christ, as he says it here, begins with the acknowledgement that he is both the son of David and of Abraham. Why? This is significant because the birth of Christ was the introduction of the one intended king, the son of David, who would sit on the throne perpetually yeah. and who would perpetually rule a kingdom. And all of that was testified in David. Now, in this genealogy here, all you see is, you know, David begets Solomon, Jesse beget David. He's the son of David. But look at the whole thing of David, and that is all included here. All of the testimony that's in David and a promised seed, a promised king. So, and then you have a promised seed in Abraham. Now we have the son of not only David, but he's the son of Abraham. Because you see how it starts. It starts Jesus, who is the son of David and the son of Abraham. At the end, it says Mary, through whom was born Jesus. What does it do? It ties that moment to the whole of a testimony. Abraham, David, every king that he names, 
Ruth. I mean, just look at it. This is the generation to which his faithfulness extended. These people, read read Hebrews 11, and you'll see what I'm talking about. All of that, they waited by faith, looked for by faith, waited for a city whose builder and maker would God, waited for a better resurrection, waited, 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 by faith Ooh. did it all. Why? Because they knew by faith that the God who made this promise to them and every generation under that age was faithful to fulfill it. And Paul says to them in chapter 10, the God who has made such a promise has not lied to you. The one who said it has done it. Amen. Well, because his faithfulness was throughout all generations unto the coming of the conclusion of the testimony of his word. To me, this is wonderful. Yes. The faithfulness of God. And again, this is not shout up and jump around stuff, but this is showing you how meticulous God's testimony is. And you know what else it's, it's indicative of how singular its testimony is. God did not deviate in one way at all throughout all those generations. God utilized everything in those generations to testify of one singularity, one thing, one perfect thing. Ooh. And you see that in the birth of Christ here, God's word and testimony and his faithfulness that is described therein comes in fullness. Because his coming encapsulates the entire performing of a preordained intention of God toward his people. The intention of God that we now by faith partake of. Psalms chapter 22, if you read verse 30 and 31, the whole of that psalm is just just beautiful of course it's a messianic psalm speaking of the really the work of the cross the crucifixion of christ and we'll talk about that in a second but in verse 30 of psalms 22 it says a seed shall serve him and it shall be accounted to the lord for what a generation why because there is a moment in time in the coming of a seed that in that seed, the true generation in which all the realities of God come to their fulfillment, that generation will be the generation that takes hold of it. In that seed, it is accounted by the Lord as a generation. This is the generation that God had in mind. This is the generation that God promised all things unto and who now receives it. We'll see in a moment him talking to the Pharisees and to the Jews and saying, you're an adulterous and wicked generation. Why does he call them that? Now, let me read the commentary here real quick. This is from James and Fawcett and Brown uh, in reference here to a seed shall serve him. And he references Isaiah 53 and 10, and it speaks of about the, the seed suffering and in the suffering of the seed, God would see him and be satisfied. This is the work of the cross. As he is the seed long promised, this is the commentary. So he also has a seed which springs up from him spiritually. Who is accounted to the Lord, the seed mentioned here shall be accounted. That means in the Hebrew, it actually means to be declared. To be accounted means to be declared. Shall be declared to the Lord for a generation, and look at what he says here, by adoption. Mm -hmm. A generation by adoption. Not by natural lineage, but by adoption. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, if you read this in... Psalms 22, you have to understand the whole outline and overall theme of Psalms 22. And we know Psalms 23 very well. 
Psalms 23 or 22 speaks of the work of the cross. And it begins this way. Why hast thou forsaken me? My God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? And you know how it ends? It is done. Mm -hmm. It is finished. It is finished. Yeah. Let me read the actual. Let me get to it here. They will come. Speaking of this generation that is now accounted to him. Verse 31. They will come and will declare what? His righteousness. Righteousness. You read, you read that in Romans 3, right? That the whole plan of God to a people who had fallen short, come short of God, of the glory of God. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. Now it says God's whole work in the propitiation of Christ was so that in his resurrection and his finished work that it would declare his righteousness. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that he is the righteousness of those who believe. And those who are now accounted as a generation in the seed himself will now come and declare his righteousness. Not Amen. there. Amen. Not there. Yeah. His. Right. Good. Yes. And, and they're going to declare his righteousness to who? A people who will be born. And to those who are born again, what will they proclaim to them? He has performed this. Mm -hmm. he's done it that's the finished work again psalms 22 begins with my god my god why has you how why have you forsaken me and it ends by it is done Mm -hmm. and he has done it that's the whole work of salvation through the work of the cross and that's what we're seeing god's faithfulness extended through this whole thing So that that generation to whom the promises were made, if you go back to what we've been talking about in Romans chapter 8, when you see a people subjected by God in hope, that's the generation that he he placed as subjects to their own vanity, as Romans 8 will say. But he did so in hope with an expectation that in the coming of this one, who would fulfill God's faithful promises to them, they would find all that God had promised. In this one, hope would be realized. Amen. God never rested, had it rest upon men. He always, because it was predestined and predetermined, and I say pre-concluded in Christ, he always throughout all those generations testified of that one in his coming. And here we're seeing in a prophetic manner the declaration of the generation that receives his faithfulness. Those who by faith receive what was promised and prophesied in the seed. And they are now as those who have received him accounted to God for a generation. God has performed this. So faithfulness of God and his testimony continues so much so that Paul writes in the Hebrew letter that there is a rest that remaineth for the people of God. Because it had to stop as far as God's faithfulness extending to all generations because his fulfillment to those generations to whom he promised it that fulfillment is now available to all generations that shall come. Amen. Mm-hmm. Oh. Amen. Amen. God didn't just stop anything. He finished and fulfilled his promise. And now that promise is available to whosoever will come. Boom. So when you read this in Matthew uh, chapter one, we'll go on here, but. In, uh, let's see, Matthew, Matthew 1, and this is in relation to what we just read in Psalms 22 and the work that God had performed here. 
Matthew 1, 21 through 23. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to, to do what? To fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, we'll read what Mary uh, says in just a moment, but let's, let's look back for a second. The New Testament begins with a genealogy of Jesus for a reason. To show them that everything God did in the preceding thing, which was the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, those things, that age, that moment of prophets and laws and promises, all of that was not for naught. All of that, all of that had a purpose. And it begins by saying, this whole thing culminates with one thing, and that is Jesus Christ. So he could call this the birth role. Some, some translations say this is the birth role of Jesus Christ. This is the lineage of Jesus Christ, showing that the whole thing was not about individual stories, individual things. It's not God had a bad attitude under that system, and now he's got a good attitude that God did everything he did throughout that whole time. And that was a long time for one purpose. And that was so this one would come. Does that not tell us how significant he is? How, how can we ever believe that we now, us, that we have some kind of a part to play in this? as far as a decisive part to a part that's going to decide anything when the whole story that God started in creating an entire world was so that he could finally bring one man. That's significant. Mm -hmm. One man had to come, and God did everything he did. I mean, you're talking about deaths. You're talking about wiping out nations. You're talking about setting up kings. And, and it, when you, what we read, uh, what was it, in Proverbs 8, the last class, when we talked about before anything was, I was there, and daily I was his delight. Mm -hmm. It also speaks there and says, by me, kings are raised up, and by me, kings are cast down. He's not talking about Joe Biden. He's talking about the kings under the old covenant. By wisdom, God set some up, brought some down. Saul and David and Solomon and all the others. We have to see these things in context of God meticulously using these things to testify and ultimately bringing into the world the savior of the world. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, I know this is very simple, but this is significant with regard to what we're reading in this psalm. Why is it that his law is faithful? Because his word and everything in it was established beforehand in heaven before there was a man to read the word. Because the word is not words, the word is a man out from whom everything God did or said proceeds. And now what we have received in Christ is a predetermined thing, something settled upon and established of God before we ever could partake of it. That lets you know that we do not have any power in this. We are partakers if we are anything. God has to, by his gift, give to our soul that one that that soul was created for. If not, oh, then our Lord. soul does not partake of the faithfulness of God. Doesn't matter how good your job is or how great your car is. Faithfulness is not found in those things. God's faithfulness is found to a generational, is a generational matter. 
because it's something that he promised to a generation and finally culminated in it. We'll read that in a moment. You'll read, when you read the, uh, the genealogy or the generations or the, and how that, the lineage, when you read it in Luke, it is different from the one that we read here in Matthew. And the reason is not because there's a distinction, but there was an intent. There was a purpose in the way they describe it. And that was the reason for this was to show that the, the intended conclusion to the word, God's faithfulness in the testimony reaches to the very beginning. Why? Because in Luke, this is in Luke three. Starting in verse 23. And it goes through all the basic, it didn't go through the same people, but it's speaking of basically it goes through the tribes and all of the things. And then here's the, here's the part I want to read because I'm not going to bore you with all the words, but verse 38, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, who was the son of God. Luke's intention here was to show that the faithfulness of God, that the promises of God concluded in this one who is now born, reaches all the way back to the very beginning, all the way back to Adam. This was not an afterthought. God reached all the way back to the first man. Because now we're about to see a new creation in this man be realized. Now we understand that it actually reaches into eternity. And that is why, again, the psalmist says the word is settled in heaven forever. But when you read these genealogies, you have to understand they use, they utilize different people because they have different objectives in their narrative, in the story they're going to tell of this one. What we just read in Matthew was so that he could show them this one is the culmination of Abraham and David. He's the seed that uh, of Abraham that was promised, and he's the king. of He's the son of David who shall sit upon the throne. Ooh. And if you read that, it's throughout this these Gospels. It doesn't stop. It, it continues to be touched upon throughout these Gospels, the different distinct parts of it. To understand more what Jesus says to them now, you can go to Matthew chapter 12, because now he's showing them who he is. They are rejecting him, challenging him, and look what he says to them. Because what they do is they ask him for a sign. Here. If you are who you claim you are, Show us a sign. Give us external proof and we'll believe you, which they wouldn't. They just wanted to test him. So they wanted to show a sign and to prove to them that he was from God. And here's what he said. He answered and said to them, again, Matthew 12, 39, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And there shall be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. But Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now look at what he says, because he's taking this and he's reaching back into the testimony and showing how he is the conclusion of the faithful testimony and the promises of God. He's saying, that's who I am, but he's pulling back and saying, these people under this system will now rise up in judgment against you. The men of Nineveh, he says, shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented 
at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. See what he's doing? He's showing God's faithfulness through the testimony. He's like, this is me. I'm the reason there was a Jonas. I'm a reason that Nineveh repented because I am the testimony. I'm the reason it existed. I am come to bring fulfillment to it. Mm. Meaning God has fulfilled these things in me. They will condemn you, meaning their testimony, because they, as a testimony, repented, and the greater than Jonas is right here in your presence, and you will not repent. They are a judgment against you. And then he goes on, the queen of the south, or Sheba, shall rise up in judgment with this generation. And condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Why can he call them a wicked generation? Why are they going to stand in judgment and condemn this generation? Because they, as a generation, would not lay hold of God's promises fulfilled. God's faithfulness was through all generations to finally come to be fulfilled. And that generation said, nope. We don't want it. <laughs> Do you understand why he sits there and tells them, listen, kings have desired to see what you're seeing. Amen. Prophets have desired to behold the thing, that to hear the voice that you are now hearing, and you reject me. So he's reaching back to a faithful testimony and showing I'm their conclusion. I'm the reason they exist. God has not lied to you, and he has not set any future date upon its fulfillment because I'm standing right here. Man, this is strong stuff. Because what they were giving up was God's promises, God's prophecies, and the blessings that he told them they would receive. Mm -hmm. They're rejecting all of it. Mm -hmm. They were saying no to all of it. Now, let's go, let's go to uh, Acts chapter 13. Uh, verse 14, we'll start there. Verse 14, but when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them saying, you men and brethren, if you have any word or exhortation for the people, say on. Then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand said, beckoning with his hand said, men of Israel, and you that fear God, give audience. Now look what he's about to do. Again, the faithfulness of God to his generation. They're going to show a whole list of the ways that God, that was a testimony and how God utilized the ages and the times of generations after generation to testify of one thing. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. With a high arm brought he them out of it. And about the time of 40 years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that, he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they desired a king. And God gave unto them Saul, the son of Sis, and the man of the tribe of Benjamin by the space of 40 years. When he had removed him, he raised unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart which shall fulfill all my will. Now, do you see a significance of why the genealogy of Matthew 1 starts with Jesus, the son of David? 
Yes. Mm-hmm. Here's the man after my own heart. There's the continuation of that lineage, the one who shall fulfill my will. And it's of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a savior, Jesus. Who does it say he raised it up? He raised it to first church or the Baptist church. No, he raised it to Israel because it was to them first the promise was made. What he's showing to them is God's faithfulness has not stopped. God's faithfulness has been fulfilled unto you. And it continued throughout until this moment. When was it fulfilled? When John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John fulfilled his course, he said, whom think ye that I am? Again, John being the consummation of the law and the prophets. Who do you think I am? I am not he. But behold, there cometh one after me, whose shoes of his feet I am not worthy to loose. Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. Not what he's saying to them right now, the word of their salvation. Who is that? the word that was settled in heaven forever, that what we talked about last week. To you, this word of salvation has been sent by God. For all that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophet, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, they desire, yet desired <clears throat> they pilot that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings. How that the promise, listen to this. This is what we're talking about. These are the generations to whom his faithfulness continued. We declare glad tidings to you. Here's the good news, guys. The promise which was made unto the fathers. God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children. What is that? That's generation after generation. What he said to the fathers, he's fulfilled to their children and to their children and to their, that fulfillment never ceases to be. He's just telling them what God spoke to the generations has now come to this generation in fulfillment. He has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he raised up Jesus. As is written in the second Psalm, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption. He saith on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another Psalm, thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and he saw corruption. Meaning David's not the fulfillment of it. But he, whom God raised again, saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin. And by him, all that believe, listen to this, because this is, this is the hope of this psalmist. This is the thing we've been talking about the whole time. This is the ultimate hope of the psalmist in 119 crying out for the mercies of God, crying out that God would finally give him life. And he says here, by him, by this man, all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. I love that. Look at that. He takes them through the whole story of the generations 
and the generations and the generations and the promises and all of that. He takes them through all of it, and then he concludes it in one risen son. And then he says, the ultimate purpose in all of this, the fulfillment of it all, is that he has come to justify you from everything from which the law of Moses could not justify you. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Amen. The law of Moses was a testimony. Yes. And it was faithfulness in the declaration of one man who in his coming could deliver them from the thing that kept them bound to sin and death. Because that was the ultimate issue. That was the ultimate issue. While they debated, is this the time the kingdom will finally come? Yes. And you know how that kingdom comes? As righteousness in your soul. Hallelujah. In, in Genesis 17, 6 through 9, I will make thee exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of thee. Kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in, the, in their generations for an everlasting covenant. To be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger. All the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generation. And then Psalms 90 says the same thing. And then uh, you can read these later in the whole of Psalms 100. Make a listen. Let me, let me read Psalms 100. It's, it's a short Psalm. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve, and isn't that something we talk about that? Well, God said, make a joyful noise. <laughs> and we think that means I can just caterwaul, and God said, make a you know, joyful noise. All those people that couldn't sing, that was always what they started with, right? <laughs> That's not what it's talking about. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord gladness and come before his presence with singing know ye that the lord he is god it is he that has made us and not we ourselves we are his people the sheep of his pasture enter into his gates with thanksgiving into his courts with praise and be thankful unto him and bless his name for the lord is good his mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. It's the same thing. The generations waiting for the faithfulness of God to be in truth made manifest. Yeah. Those who would receive his mercy and his truth. You remember what uh, John writes? But grace and truth came in Christ, the word made flesh, because Moses, the, the, the law came through Moses, grace and truth came in Christ. Why do you think it's significant that the blind man cried out as Jesus is passing by and said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Because he understood the promise that God made. And he understood in the passing of Jesus that God had not failed in keeping that promise. And he cries out to the one who is the hope of all generations and who is the fulfillment of God's promises to the all generations. Mm -hmm. Have mercy on me. Mm -hmm. Now, to end this tonight, and I, I'm sorry, I've gone long. Let's go back. Luke chapter one. And again, we said we we're going to talk about uh, what Mary says. Mary said, My soul. Verse 30. 
Luke 1, verse 30, the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, shall be called the son of the highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne. Listen to these things. The throne of his father, David. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. Do you see this whole theme, this whole thought of God's promises being realized in this man? Yes. God's faithfulness to all generations has finally brought, been brought to pass. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom, there shall be no end. And then we jump down to verse 46 and Mary said, my soul. my soul doth magnify the Lord and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my savior, for he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth, listen to these words, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. What does that mean? I know the Catholic Church has taken that farther <laughs> than is meant. <laughs> what does it mean? This is not just meaning every generation from this moment on is going to call me blessed. She's saying he, all generations past present future will look to this moment in time where god used me for this purpose and will call mm -hmm. me blessed why we've already read it that through her comes the christ of god yes because now she is the she is the vessel through which god got the promised one to his people Amen. And now they will say, blessed are you, Mary, for it is through you that he, that God had promised throughout generation after generation has finally come. And they will call her blessed because now he is here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He that is mighty had done to me this great thing. Holy is his name and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation you understand this coming of christ the birth of christ this whole work was god's mercy coming upon those who fear him from generation to generation the mercy that this psalmist is always crying out for that would finally come Ooh. he has showed strength with his arm and has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts He's talking about the Jews under the law who, who see themselves as holy, righteous, the proud. He has put down the mighty from their seats, exalted them of low degree. He has filled the hungry with the good things. See, that's the one Jesus, again, in Matthew 5, we talked about. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst. They shall be filled. And he filled in this moment, he came as the bread from heaven to fill the hungry with the good things and the rich, those who think they're rich and do endowed with goods and need of nothing under the law, he sent them away empty. And he hath hope in his servant Israel. What's that word mean? It means to assist them in supplying what is needed, what lacks. He's hoping his servant Israel in remembrance of what his mercy as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Do you see that? Mary even brings it in the context of God's faithfulness to his testimony. And he says everything he spoke to the fathers, this is what's happening right now. It's all coming to its conclusion. All of it. This is why you can read in Psalms 105, verse 8, he that he hath remembered his covenant forever and the word which he has commanded to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac. And he confirmed the same unto Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. 
You see how he connects the whole thing. Generations after generations, God's faithfulness continued as a thread of testimony until the moment of this moment right here when he came. Emmanuel, God with us, the Christ of God, the fulfillment of the promises, the good news of his birth. And so those of us who are in Christ, Paul can write to in Colossians, right? In, in, in chapter one and say, he has made a minister, even the mystery, which has been hidden from ages and from generations. Throughout those times, God said it, promised it, and utilized things to talk about it and testify of it. But the whole time, those generations, it was kept hidden. The reality was still hidden. It was still a mystery. But now, it is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery, that was throughout all generations, but hidden from them throughout all generations. What is the mystery now? Christ in you. In you. The hope of glory. Yeah. See, there's God's faithfulness to all generations finally realized. Yeah. Yeah, Christ yeah. in you. What he promised to, but kept hidden from those generations now has come to touch the soul of those who believe yeah. and has provided to those souls all that God promised. Oh, so, Amen. We'll stop there tonight, guys. Amen.